I'd like to talk about what happened with some basic first order circuits that I'd be using op-amp type devices. But in this case, I want to actually think about maybe shifting a little from some of my other videos where I have a lot of like resistors and capacitors and really sort of focus on some of the inductor based circuits. There's nothing particularly different about the inductors except that the way that their IV relationship is different. Now remember one of the things that's going to be very nice about it is that I have two R's here and here. So as I look at the circuit for this part of it, it feels like a typical inverting amplifier. And I know that if I look at the inductor, we're going to be talking about using Laplace type techniques here so I can think about this resistor as, or this inductor as a resistor of value SL. Some more sort of thing I could talk about if I look at this structure up here. It looks very similar to sort of a structure where I have two resistors for an inverting configuration, but I've also added an inductor in there as well. And, you know, we might have been used to seeing a capacitor in the feedback loop. Now we're going to talk about what happens if I put an inductor in the feedback loop and how does that change the overall dynamics of what, I, of what I'm building. So this is where, where you start beginning with this. So you can start to talk about a circuit, something along this lines, and what you begin to realize is that if I, if I just take a look at, you know, I could do the straight KCL throughout this node, and looking at that I get sort of related to this equation. The input over R plus SL is a minus V out over R2. I could have very equally just also looked at this thing and said, you know what, another way to think about it is I could say, what is this? effective resistance now now it's dependent on s maybe i call it impedance it's all kind of the same thing and i realize that the gain is going to be this resistance or impedance over this resistance or impedance again impedance is just a fancy word that means resistance with s eh, same stuff and so i'd notice it'd be r2 over well the series combination r1 plus sl yay this is cool and so if i actually look at this i can do a little bit of rearranging this gives me then R2 over R1, 1 plus 1 over S, S tau. This is kind of cool because this now gives me a typical low pass response. If I take R1 and R2 are, are just equal to 6 ohms, then I'm going to get a gain of minus 1. So the magnitude is going to give me 1. And then I'll find the frequency response. Remember, I'm taking S and it's becoming J omega. Okay. Because basically I'm looking at just the steady state frequency components. So the sigma part which is really related to the exponential increases and decreases in, the, in as a result of the response, really don't occur because I've reached kind of a steady state sinusoid output. And so in that case, what I find is that it's relatively flat, has a breakpoint around a kilohertz, and then falls off basically in sort of this relationship that as I increase frequency um, by a factor of 10, I'm going to decrease the amplitude by a factor of 10. So it's an inverse proportionality. Similar thing happens with this circuit. In fact, instead of trying to go through the KCL like I did for over here, what I'm basically just going to say is, all right, I can now see that I got different elements. Well, I can see that the input part is going to be R1. That's in the denominator. There's a minus sign. And then I realize I've got R2 parallel R SL. And I just put that together. <laughs> Well, a little bit of math actually gets me to this relationship, R2 over R1, and then I see the time constants. And remember, the time constants actually fall out of what's actually happening in the math. It isn't like something like magical. Oh my gosh, I need to have like some special formulas or whatever. It's like, it's just what falls out of doing the analysis. And you might eventually see how to do this very quickly. You might say, I can take a whole bunch of resistive networks and make a Norton, Thevenin equivalent, reduce things down. But no matter what it is, it's still all going to be kind of the same concept. And so as a result, I get R2 over R1, 1, 1 and S tau over 1 plus S tau. Now this gives me a high pass response. This gives me a low pass response. This is low pass because notice the low frequency components go through. The high frequency components get attenuated. If I look at the resulting frequency response in this case, I see that the low frequency components get attenuated or decreased in their gain. And in the higher frequency components, pretty much all pass through. So I get a resulting tau. Again, that gives me a frequency cutoff right at about 1, one kilohertz. Um, and this should have been kilohertz here. Um, but that's basically what you're going to see for this. And so what's nice is these various structures, and particularly op-amp circuits, get really straightforward to look at the analysis. But we could have done things that could have just been um, 
resistor dividers and other kinds of things that had the inductors and we'd imagine getting very very similar results in any of these situations. 